on today's Angry Bulletin. Now that NASA has decided which types of ships are going to be carrying astronauts down to the surface of the moon, they now need to determine what kind of vehicle is going to be providing mobility on the moon. What type of rover is going to work best with Lunar Starship? Four, three, two, one, ignition. And on the other side of the Atlantic, a successful hot fire test on the upper stage of a brand new rocket from RFA Rocket Factory Augsburg. And that is just one of three promising new launch providers coming out of Germany, all of whom are looking to send a rocket either to suborbital flight or all the way to orbit before the end of the year. Are they going to be able to carry this out? And will that make one of these companies the first company to successfully reach orbit from European soil? All of this and more coming to you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us here on The Angry Astronaut. I mentioned this over the weekend, but I want to go ahead and reiterate it. If you're looking to support my GoFundMe page, please do not do so this week. Instead, I would ask you to support the Astro Liz Fund, a charity that is dedicated to bringing education and opportunities to young women in the United Kingdom who would like to pursue a career in space and a career in STEM. This is very near and dear to my heart because my own daughter is pursuing a career in STEM on her way actually yesterday to an intern job in North Carolina where she will be working on modular nuclear reactors, the same kind of reactors that will be used in space. So if this is something that you can support, please do so linked in the description. Let's move on to our first item of business. Germany, of course, has been a leading force in the development of rocketry for a very long period of time, but they have never sent anything to orbit, at least not from European soil. But now we have three promising emerging launch providers in Germany that are looking to reach orbit for the first time from European soil now that Virgin Orbit gave them that opportunity, and also companies like Astra and ABM seem to be struggling to reach orbit as well. So what do these newcomers bring to the market and why will they be successful? At the end of last month, Rocket Factory Augsburg, or RFA, successfully carried out a full-duration hot-fire test of their new Helix engine. This engine is a staged combustion engine. This is getting very popular right now, and here's what makes it different for those of you unfamiliar with what staged combustion means. In staged combustion, the exhaust gases from an oxygen-rich pre-burner are then fed into the main combustion chamber after driving the turbo pump meaning that the exhaust gases are carrying out two operations in the same burn. The fuel is burned more efficiently, therefore, and this improves the performance by at least 7%, which translates into 30% more payload. Unlike a lot of other stage combustion engines right now, though, this is running off of RP1 and not methane, which may make it a little bit easier to get off the ground, because up to this point, no no methalox-powered rocket has been able to achieve orbit. Currently, the Helix engines have a thrust of 100 kilonewtons, not much when you compare it to a Raptor, but then again, this rocket is not designed to compete against Starship, and it has an ISP of 325 seconds at sea level and 350 seconds in vacuum. Nine Helix engines are going to be used in the first stage, and one vacuum-optimized Helix engine will be used in the second stage. However, 
this is a three-stage rocket, and this is one of the reasons why I like RFA, and I like so many emerging European providers because they are so innovative and they're coming out with new solutions to pair with these rockets in order to make them more attractive. This is the Redshift, an orbital transfer vehicle, also known as a space tug, that can carry out a wide variety of duties in orbit after the primary payload has been delivered. What that means is it can carry out things like satellite inspection, space debris removal, end-of-life management for satellites, and also can extend the life of a satellite, pushing it back into orbit if its orbit is decaying. This is the kind of thing that lots of companies are trying to develop right now, but when you can launch something like this in conjunction with a dedicated payload, it means that you can carry out other jobs for other customers. This will allow RFA to deliver payloads for as little as 3 million euros per launch. Let me say that again, 3 million euros per launch. And given the fact that RFA is going to be able to deliver over one and a half metric tons to low Earth orbit, this means that RFA-1 may be able to deliver payload to orbit for as little as $2,000 a kilogram, whereas Falcon 9 costs about $2,700 per kilogram. And also given that European satellite manufacturers are going to be able to use RFA without having to transport their payloads across the Atlantic and also the technicians and everything else you need to send a payload into orbit, this will make RFA extremely competitive against Falcon 9 rideshare from a cost perspective as well as an efficiency and ease of use perspective. That makes it different than any other launch provider on the planet right now. And it is for this reason that a billion dollar satellite company called OHB in Germany, one of the largest in the world, is financially backing RFA right now, making them a very good bet in the future of European and launch providers, but they're not the only game in town. This is the Hyplock 75 from High Impulse, a hybrid rocket engine that runs off of both liquid and solid rocket fuels. The solid rocket fuel being paraffin, and of course the liquid part being liquid oxygen. What this means is the engine can be delivered fully fueled to the launch site with only the oxygen having to be added, making the initial fueling process a lot more simplistic, but in addition to that, since it has liquid oxygen, it means that it can be throttled, shut down, restarted, all the sorts of things that solid rocket engines cannot. Hybrid engines are of course very innovative, and I like that, and this particular engine will be driving a suborbital rocket into space from the Saxavord spaceport on October 1st of this year. I ju just got confirmation on the date from Frank Strang, the director out at Saxavord. Very excited about that but this is just the beginning. The Orbital High Impulse SL-1 will be powered by eight of these 75 kilonewton engines, followed by a second stage with a cluster of four of these engines, followed by a third stage with a cluster of four 25 kilonewton engines, giving it a payload capability of approximately 500 kilograms into low Earth orbit. Obviously, not massive payloads, but very easy to fuel, very cheap cheap to produce, and therefore a very low launch cost. High Impulse is going to be another potent player in the whole European launch market. We will see how well they compete against the likes of RFA and the likes of ESAR Aerospace. ESAR may be the most formidable of these three competitors. How so? Well, they have a hell of a lot of financial backing. In two rounds of fundraising, they have raised over 300 
hundred million euros worth of support, and on top of that, they are getting support from the European Space Agency. ESAR's philosophy is very different from that of RFA. Instead of relying on off-the-shelf components from the automotive industry the way RFA does, they rely on in-house developed technology and a lot of 3D printing very similar to SpaceX's philosophy. And since they've raised so much money and also have the financial backing of a colossus like Airbus, this gives them the financial flexibility to send up at least four test launches of their new Spectrum rocket before they even need to carry up paying customers. This, of course, is extremely important to new launch providers because very few, if any of these companies, are going to be successful on their first try. SpaceX definitely was not. Three straight failures before they finally made it to orbit on their first fourth try, and Elon admits that they would have gone bankrupt had they not made it to orbit on that fourth attempt. The Spectrum is capable of carrying a full metric ton to low Earth orbit and 700 kilograms to sun-synchronous orbit, in other words, about triple the capacity of the Rocket Lab Electron. When it comes right down to it, all of these companies have the ability to deliver larger payloads than Rocket Lab and a lot of their other competitors, but the big question is, how many of them will be successful and which will be the first one to reach orbit? I suspect that we're going to have an answer to that question in the next few months. And now for the story you've all been waiting for, Lunar Starship and the rover that NASA intends to use with it. However, if you skipped over the German part of this video, you missed some really good content. I strongly recommend that you back up and check that out. So now that Lunar Starship has been selected along with Blue Origin, how is NASA going to be able to carry out mobility on the lunar surface? Because Lunar Starship is not going to be able to set down in very rough terrain. Well, at first they're going to go with an unpressurized solution. The one you're looking at right now is from Astrolab, one of a number of companies that are going to be submitting proposals. Lockheed Martin and General Motors are going to be proposing their own rover and Northrop Grumman together with Intuitive Machines, Lunar Outpost and Michelin are going to be proposing along with Teledyne Brown Engineering together with Sierra Space and Nissan North America and as I said before Astrolab and finally Lidos and NASCAR are going to be putting forward their idea for a rover and that's what you're looking at right now. Incidentally, I was the first journalist organization to break this story on April 17th, 2023 from Colorado Springs, thanks to my friends at Dynetics, who are incidentally part of the Lidos family of companies. Thanks very much to Dynetics for giving me this opportunity, and by the way, the gentleman who's leading me around worked on the original Apollo landers, and as you can see, this thing is not really all that dissimilar from some of the rovers that Apollo used, but it is actually quite different. It's a cross between an Apollo-style lunar rover and a Mars-style uncrewed rover. It supports phases driven by astronauts and phases as an uncrewed mobile science exploration platform similar to NASA's Curiosity and Perseverance Mars rovers. This allows continued performance of science even when crews are not present on the lunar surface, which is going to be most of the time. Artemis astronauts will use the LTV to traverse the lunar surface and transport scientific equipment, extending the distances that they can cover on each moonwalk. The cargo capacity is not that enormous, however. We're only talking 800 kilograms worth of payload, including the two astronauts who are supposed to ride on this thing. Engineers back on Earth, and more importantly on the Lunar Gateway, will be able to operate the LTV remotely to transport cargo and scientific payloads between crewed landing sites, enabling additional scientific returns, resource prospecting, and lunar exploration. This will expand scientific research opportunities on the Moon during uncrewed operations, allow scientists to investigate future surface mission locations, and finally to 
to inform research goals and objectives for each site. So this thing is a lot more than just a lunar golf cart like the astronauts used back in the early 1970s. And it also has to be able to handle the unique environment of the lunar south pole, which includes permanently shadowed regions. These kinds of things were never experienced by Apollo astronauts, extended periods without sunlight, and the LTV will need to utilize several different systems, including hybrid powered systems, in order to support the crewed and uncrewed operations. Some of the more critical systems will include advanced power management, semi-autonomous driving, state-of-the-art communication and navigation systems, and of course, protection from extreme environments. The companies making the proposal need to provide end-to-end -end services. This means that they need to develop the rover, deliver it to the lunar surface, which means they need to partner with some kind of launch provider and demonstrate execution of the operations. So they need to deliver one of these things to the lunar surface and demonstrate how it works before NASA uses it on Artemis 5. That's going to be the first mission that makes use of this rover in 2029. Each rover must be able to carry two suited astronauts, as I suggested before, also accommodate a robotic arm or mechanism to support scientific operations, and of course to survive extreme temperatures at the lunar south pole. Like many of NASA's recent contracts, this is a fixed price contract that will probably have multiple vendors competing during different stages of the program, meaning that it, there will be at least two competing LTV providers once NASA makes their decision sometime later this year. The deadline for the proposals is July 10th, 2023. So we'll be seeing a lot of these upcoming proposals for lunar landers very soon this summer, and that should all be very exciting indeed. Now, why is NASA going with this kind of solution instead of a pressurized rover? Probably because NASA's needs during the early stage of Artemis really does not require a mobile habitat, but rather a rover that provides a limited amount of mobility in the immediate vicinity of Lunar Starship with the capability of traveling between landing sites and also to carry out a lot of science that won't involve any astronauts at all. Whereas the Toyota Moon Cruiser, a pressurized rover that is scheduled to arrive sometime at the end of this decade as well, is more of a mobile habitat designed to explore a considerable portion of the lunar surface, and that probably won't be needed until later Artemis missions. I don't currently have any favorites in this race, although I certainly have my biases because my friends at Sierra Space and at Dynetics are involved in this race on opposing teams, so I'm going to be pretty torn as I continue to cover this event. In the meantime, please like, please subscribe, don't forget to support Astro Liz's charity, and also please start sharing my videos. The best and least expensive way to support my content is to get more people to watch it, so please share it with friends and family, or even better, share it on Twitter, Instagram, and other social media platforms. That will help me tremendously. And as always, guys, stay angry about space. Peace.